All righty. Good evening, everyone. We're thrilled to have you here for the third segment um, of our Road to Rowan SOM series. Today, we're focusing on PBL with the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Victor Scali. We're thrilled the pieces to have him here with us tonight. Um, to kick us off, as we've always done, I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Miss Sarah Watkins and Miss uh, uh, Miss Paul. Sarah Watkins, Miss Sarah Ramick, and Miss Paula Watkins. Sorry, the names popped up and crossed there. Um, I use we usually kick off with uh, the Dean of Admissions, Dean Paula Watkins, just kind of saying hi and welcoming us to the session. So, without further ado, I'd like to have Paula say hi, and then we'll get started from there. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. So, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And um, this is going to be a great session. So excited to hear from Dr. Scali. Um, you know, the amazing information you're going to get about PBL. And so appreciate you being here. Um, please feel free to ask your questions when the um, time permits. And, um, you know, thank you so much, John and Sarah, for the help that you uh, have uh, put, to put this together tonight. And um, so we're really excited to have Dr. Scali here. And if you have any questions of the admissions team while we're here as well, please feel free to ask. And uh, without further ado, thank you so much, John and Dr. Scali. We appreciate your time today and look forward to hearing uh, your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you all. First of all, I'd like to say good evening to everyone who has taken the time out uh, after hours to join us tonight. And first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Rowan SOM family. I want to tell you a little bit about PBL tonight in a little more detail that maybe you've seen. And I need to tell you why you need to trust the process. So at the end, I want you to tell me if you trust the process. Before I get started, I wanted to let you know that Dr. George Scott, our Associate Dean at the Sewell campus is in the house. George, thank you for coming. And you may direct some of his some questions to him because he's the man to put that building together. So um, we're really excited tonight to talk to you. <clears throat> My name is uh, Vic Scali. I'm the director of the PBL curriculum and professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Rowan SOM. Just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I was a ER physician for 35 years, clinically retired about seven years ago, had always been teaching in academics with students, residents and attending physicians in emergency medicine. Uh, I was co-director of an EM residency at now Jefferson of South Jersey, which was the Kennedy Health System for 23 years, and also the founder and director of the EMIM residency that uh, was at Rowan and at Kennedy uh, back in the early 2000s. So let's get started. And of course, okay, all right. Uh, this you may already know that Rowan offers two distinct uh, yet equal educational pathways to complete your preclinical and clinical training. We have the synergistic guided learning curriculum, which is one phase of what we call tensegrity. And I'm sure that you may have even already heard from Dean Chanel uh, who is really the founder of the renewed uh, synergistic guided pathway in tensegrity. The other pathway is problem-based learning. And problem-based learning is not new. It goes back to McMaster University in Canada. Uh, the father of problem-based learning was at Southern Illinois University uh, in the 70s and 80s. And we still use a lot of his tenants in the teaching of problem-based learning. So why did you consider the Tensegrity PBLC curriculum? Well, first of all, I'm sure you were trying to match your learning style. I know that you thrive in small learning groups that encourage dialogue. We see much more of this in the undergraduate education process. Uh, instead of what we considered a traditional lecture-based curriculum, uh, when I went to med school in the Mesozoic era, when dinosaurs ruled the world, uh, we were in class from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and we listened to lectures all day. As you can see, I made it through, 
but you're going to do much better than me. The methodology is utilizes small groups. You're going to be in groups of eight students with a facilitator. The facilitator functions as your academic coach. He's really that he or she is really the guide on the side. Uh, in a traditional um, lecture-based curriculum like I went through, the, fa the facilitators were really the sage on the stage of the conversation. So with problem-based learning, we take real clinical cases and we use them as the backdrop for under, under uh, to learning the underlying basic science concepts that correlate with the pathophys of the disease process and the well state. And it also prepares you very well for licensure board exams because we incorporate a very high level, second level questions that are very much like COMLEX and USMLE throughout. Another offset of PBL in the, in the curriculum is that you learn critical thinking and problem solving very early. All the clinical cases that we present to you are presented as unknowns. So you get a chief complaint and you work that patient through just like any attending physician you will solve over 100 clinical cases over two years. Another aspect of PBL is that uh, our students actually choose what they learn, how they learn it, and what sources they use. Textbooks are indeed used by many, many, many students, but they use a variety of YouTube videos, um, medical journal articles, webcasts. They do they actually attend some of the traditional lectures uh, that they choose that may help their understanding, or they may go to the echoed traditional lectures to supplement their learning. So you have a very, very broad canvas to uh, draw from. But you're not there alone, even though this is a self-guided uh, process of learning, our PBL2 students will provide guidance to you in the early phases, particularly in the first year, to lessen that culture shock of moving from undergrad school to a medical school. We have a big SIB, little SIB program that matches each PBL student in the first year with a second year student. And they will become uh, someone that you will tend to rely on, particularly throughout that first year. What else we know with problem-based learning is that if you can self-direct your learning, you're more apt to be able to fit your unique style of learning and apply study timelines that are really developed by you. So what is the goal of self-directed study and group teaching that we see in problem-based learning? Well, it's the development of metacognitive skills. These are skills that physicians must have to be able to treat patients later with very complex medical problems. Metacognition is simple. It's thinking about thinking, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how that fits into the PPL curriculum. But you must use metacognition when confronted with a difficult, puzzling, or unexpected problem, just like a sick patient. Once you master metacognitive thinking, Making a diagnosis at the student or resident level goes beyond pattern, pattern recognition. Remember, this is the earliest phase of the diagnostic process. Dr. Mom is really good at pattern recognition when their kids are sick. You need to be better than that. And that's what we're gonna teach you with metacognitive learning. Higher levels of metacognition are really mastery post-residency training. And Malcolm Gladwell, if you've had the opportunity to read his book, Blink, and I highly suggest that you read it, he discusses a level of metacognition that he describes as thinking without thinking. And that's where our ultimate goal will want to be. He says that once you learn the process, you can thin slice the problem subconsciously. So when you're solving a problem, you don't need to go through six steps A to F. 
you can go from A to F subconsciously in an emergency, like intubating a cardiac arrest victim or starting a central line. There are multiple pieces to each of those things, but you, once you learn the skill, you do it flawlessly and subconsciously. Now, when do we get to the expert level? Well, it's thought to be five years after you've finished your residency and you've seen at least 10,000 patients. You're board certified in your specialty and your competency is recognized by national benchmarks. So that's where we wanna be five years out. It takes that long to master your craft. Now, here are some of the questions that a physician with metacognitive skills in treating, a, say, a difficult patient asks himself subconsciously, what's going on here? What's the entire picture? Have I thought of all the possibilities? Do I have all the facts? What does this finding mean? Have I seen this before? Am I sure I'm right or is there another way to look at this? Do I know enough about this type of problem? Where can I go to find the facts? So let's roll this over to a PBL student who's developing metacognitive skills in solving a case and asking the same questions at the level of a PBL first year student. You can see the difference. What is going on here? What is the significance of the chief complaint? You're asking yourself, what's the entire picture? Does the past medical history provide the clues I need? Have I thought of all the possibilities? Is my differential diagnosis broad enough not to miss something important? Do I have all the facts? Well, did I get an adequate history from the patient? Did I need to go to old records to get information that the patient couldn't provide? What does this finding mean? Are the physical findings significant? Do they really define what the process of pathology is going on? Have I seen this before? Hmm, I'm starting to recognize a pattern here after 50 cases that I've solved in the first year. Am I sure I'm right or is there another way to look at this? And you must ask yourself, did I avoid anchor bias? Did I make sure that I did not arrive at the diagnosis too quickly? Remember Occam's razor. He was a theologian in the 1400s and a philosopher. And Occam's razor says that the most likely diagnosis is the one with the least variables. Think about that when you are making a diagnosis. If there are too many variables, you're probably not right. Do I know enough about this type of problem? Well, in the PBL class, we can present learning issues that address common lack of knowledge among the group. And the, your group will decide that. Where can I find the facts I need? I can review basics and standard textbooks and evidence-based literature. It's so easy to get on the internet. Now, we utilize learning issues as a key portion of the PBL process. They represent important or complex concepts that the group through their discussion says is worthy of a presentation and a discussion by the students. The facilitators in the first year will encourage basic science LIs because we got to get our basic science down before that second year when we can take a deeper dive into the clinical. But we allow some clinical topics because we need to understand the clinical aspects of the case. Students choose the LIs at the end of the session and they decide from a list of things that they, as they went through the case, that they need to discuss further. They're usually 10 minute presentations in the next session. They can be PowerPoint. I've seen really interesting Jeopardy games. And I can, I've actually seen a few students just get up on the whiteboard and draw a pathway, you know, uh, of the citric acid cycle, you know, or, or the uric acid cycle. So essentially here, the students become the teachers 
And what is physician? The word physician, you're a teacher. You're going to teach the rest of your life. You're getting a, a you're getting the benefit here of getting comfortable with teaching, comfortable with small groups, then expanding to larger groups when you're a resident, when you're an attending, when you're giving national and regional lectures. All this comes back. You're developing those skills now. Facilitators may guide the conversation and they try to keep you engaged in moving forward with metacognitive questioning, but they won't lecture during the during the case. They may give you a pearl, and we do this more in the second year than we do in the first year. Uh, but uh, at the end of a, a session, you can certainly uh, come up to the facilitator and ask a question, and they may have a nice conversation with you about something offline. Our sessions are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the Stratford campus. We are we go from nine to eleven thirty. At the Sewell campus, we're going to have two uh, classes each morning, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we'll switch so that you don't have the same time every time. But they will go from eight to ten thirty with a break for fifteen minutes, and ten forty-five to one fifteen. The cases will be synchronous. They will be the same cases at Sewell and Stratford so that you can get together with your, your friends at the different campus and be able to study together and, and discuss you know, what you're finding in the case. We use we developed uh, actually a new case a system that we acquired uh, this past year. We had used the SIU system from Dr. Barrows until last year, but we upgraded this called DXR. And DXR is really cool. DXR has 120 cases, and plus we're developing our own cases that we see to fill some gaps. It's very user friendly. Uh, you will take history, physical exam, lab testing, and imaging. They're all revealed through group query, just like you're interviewing a patient. You're interviewing uh, virtually an, a, an avatar. The physical exam is really neat. It's revealed with real photos of the patient exam. There are actual heart sounds that we listen to, breath sounds, bowel sounds, and you can point to areas specifically with a pointer on the avatar. The findings then, after you make a diagnosis as a group, are verified by expert interpretation uh, on the platform. So if there's an X-ray of a chest, you will write down your diagnosis, and then we'll, we can reveal the real diagnosis. So you get that, uh, you know, making sure that we're checking your accuracy and learning process. The program also grades your group's accuracy in your workup, and whether your differential diagnosis was broad enough. It is gives you a lot of feedback. And it also adds something uh, to the program that I've not seen before. It actually shows you the cost of your workup, what it cost in how you approach that patient. So I'm going to tell you, and you're going to remember this, I'm going to be on your right shoulder five years from now. And I'm going to say you will need to be a skilled minimalist as a physician. And what does that mean? It means that when I was practicing emergency medicine, I could order anything I want. It didn't matter what the price was. The insurance companies covered it, and it wasn't outrageous in cost to the system. Now, with this, the complex systems and newer imaging and newer treatments, we got to make sure that we go back to the basics that we use the history and the physical that you're learning in these two years to give you 75% of the diagnosis. You should be using lab work and imaging to verify your diagnosis, not to throw something against the wall and hope that it sticks, okay? I hope that makes sense. 
So what's a class look like? Well, we, we like I said, we have a group of eight with a facilitator. Uh, the group picks a case driver or the facilitator designates one who's going to query the computer and run the case. There's a case recorder who actually writes the pertinent history and physical information and the lab studies on a whiteboard. We have multiple whiteboards around our, uh, our classroom walls. And a third student records the differential diagnosis and lists the learning issues as they come up by group's consensus so they can be assigned at the end of the session. As I said, the history, the physical exam, the tests and imaging are all obtained by query of the computer program. The computer program is the patient and it's done in sequential fashion. Group discussion then ensues as we get this information. We want everybody to participate. It gets really exciting. Uh, it still excites me every day that I come. I'm 74 years old and I learn something new every day that I attend a PBL2 class. Uh, I love it. So that's learning issues, a key part of the process. We have 10 case-based modules. You can see here in the PBL one year, we have pulmonary, cardionephro, gastroenterology and nutrition, endocrine repro, neuropsych, and immunology. So there are six blocks in the PBL one year. In the second year, we have hematology, oncology, cardionephro pulmonary, gastroenterology slash endocrine, neuro, musculoskeletal, and psychiatry. So there are four blocks, but you can see the majority of this represents a double pass of the topics in two years. In the second year, after you've really learned the basics of the foundational basic sciences, in the second year, we'll dive a little deeper into the basic science and we'll really dive into the pathology, the pharmacology, the management of these patients. So that is one difference between the SGL um, curriculum and the PBL curriculum. The SGL curriculum is what we call a circular curriculum that only goes a single pass through the topic. So that may be something that is attractive to you. It is very attractive to a lot of PBL students I've seen in the last six years. We have one pass-fail block exam. So that's pretty high stakes. SGL may have three exams, but I can tell you that the failure rate is the same as the traditional examinations. Uh, we're less than 10%. In all actuality, they're more like three to 5% that I've seen. Or we try to make our exams as close as possible to the licensure exams that you're going to be taking in Comlex and USMLE. We have 140 questions in an exam, and it's made up in a fashion of having 100 of the discipline-based, organ-based basic science of the title, obviously, of the block. There are 28 OMM or osteopathic manipulative medicine questions. There are 12 history and physical questions, and they will come from your OCS uh, course, your osteopathic clinical skills course given to me by the directors of those courses that are synchronous with your case, with your cases on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We try to keep the topics very similar. We pace you the same as the licensure exam at about 70 seconds per question. So you're now being prepared for the, for the pace that you need in that uh, licensure exam. It won't be anything new or difficult to complete the test in the proper time. If you have prior exam accommodations, please request them same considerations and do it during the first week of orientation so we can get you set up. 
there are some students that actually have one and a half times uh, time allowed for uh, their accommodation. A block grade, a block is considered a course. As I said, we're pass fail, but 85% of your grade of the block comes from the written exam and 15% comes from an evaluation that is done by the facilitator. So, you know, how you interact with the group, how's your knowledge base progressing, how you work as a team, how you present your LIs, your professionalism, all are evaluated because you're doing a lot of work in that classroom. One of the things that I changed when I started the, the course in 20, when we expanded course, in 16 and 17, uh, we put in the performance eval because we've really felt that there was so much work being done there in the past with the small groups of eight. We only had eight students per year for about actually 12 or 15 years. Their whole grade was the exam. So you can see this is a much better comprehensive way to evaluate you. Now, the, the curriculum, as I mentioned, is not just your, your Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, but we have osteopathic clinical skills, or what we call OCS, and it's a longitudinal full year course with two main components. The first is history and physical clinical skills, where we teach you how to interview a patient, how to take a comprehensive and a focal history, how to do vital signs, and introduce you to the basic examination of the heart, lungs, abdomen, and nervous system. This prepares you well for PBL2 when you have strictly a very, very detailed examination of each system. So you'll bring some skills to the table and you'll be tested with multiple simulated patients. So you'll get an opportunity to take those skills and apply them. Everything is pass fail, as I said. The OMM portion teaches you the didactic and the techniques of OMM. It teaches the synchronously with the block organ system and the clinical skills that you learn in H and P. We actually also use very quick three minute learning issues that we've integrated into the OMM and skill acquisition that is consistent with PBL process. As a PBL student, you also join the SGL curriculum for further longitudinal courses. The first is medical scholarship. It's a longitudinal four-year curriculum dedicated to teaching you the fundamentals of research and medicine. Many of you will bring significant research skills to the table that will be very valuable also to teaching those with less uh, history of research um, experience. We'll teach you how to review the evidence-based literature and develop a culture of patient safety and quality improvement. You will also develop a research project uh, that can go all the way to bench research, or it could be you know, a, a literature search alone on a, on a topic that's comprehensive. But you'll learn more about that uh, from the medical scholarship director. We also have a, a second longitudinal course called Community-Based Learning and Leadership, which addresses the core skills of being a leader, as a physician, you're going to be looked up to, to be a leader in many aspects of your life. And of course, learn to serve our community as leaders. And take care of our patients that need your skills. We also have focused short intercession courses. And over the course of the two years, you will get courses in emotional intelligence, human sexuality, end of life care health system sciences, which is the business side of medicine, and of course, at the end of the second year, part one board prep. 
Over the last three years, we actually added medical procedures as a as a longitudinal course. This has been really exciting and the students really love this. Uh, we start out by teaching you how to give injections, how to do phlebotomy, how to start intravenous lines, how to place Foley catheters, do arterial blood gases, perform EKGs. And what we're really excited about is that we are one of only 70% of medical schools in the country that teach you basic ultrasonography. So you will leave medical school with ultrasound skills that I had to learn over many years as an attending physician. You will have those basic skills so you can develop advanced skills as a resident and as an attending. We opened last year a state-of-the-art simulation center, a center under uh, Dr. Bolas, our director. It is amazing and you need to get uh, time to walk over and, and tour this facility. It's a more than $3 million uh, facility. It has 14 ambulatory themed and four hospital themed exam rooms. Uh, there are attached observation areas where your performance is evaluated by an expert. We have our procedural skills labs are in the simulation center. We have six new human patient simulators. I'm sure you've heard of the Laerdals uh, Simman. We have we have the 3G adult mannequin, the pediatric uh, junior mannequin, and we also have a, a birthing simulator. All the equipment that is in the simulation center is real medical equipment that you'll learn to. Um, to use, including defibrillators, what's in a crash cart, how to set up an infusion pump, and how to use the wall diagnostic equipment, which we will be teaching you also in h &P. Throughout the simulation process, we have a large cohort of very highly trained standardized patients that you will be training with over the course of the two years. In the first year h and course, you will have three uh, sessions of standardized patients and about six in the second year. And these will become uh, literally something to look forward to where you're actually interacting with a patient and using the skills that you're being taught. Within this simulation center, we even have debriefing rooms, lecture areas, presentation areas with uh, we have uh, multiple simulators uh, that simulate breath sounds and heart murmurs. It's just, it's just really cool. The audiovisual equipment is, is top notch. We have data capture software that allows us to capture and replay the events that you're participating in, even for teleconferencing and live streaming. And here are some pictures of the sim center. You can see that literally this looks like you're in a hospital emergency room. Here is a group doing a code on, on a patient that stopped breathing. So what is the evidence that the PBL curriculum works? Well, you know, I, I ask you to trust the process, but if you're going to trust the process, you got to have some evidence, right? We, we teach you evidence based medicine and we now have enough information to really, truly say that the PBL curriculum works. Our first class of 32, when we went from eight students per year to 32, uh, graduated in 2020. They all passed Comlex 1 with an average at that time of 518. Half of those students also took the USMLE Step 1 in that first class, and all of them passed uh, USMLE with a highest grade of 236. That was a pretty good performance. I can tell you that over the last five years, no PBL student has failed the USMLE Step 1 exam. I think that's pretty, pretty, Impressive. 
And in summary, though, the only three PBL students failed Comlex 1 in the last two years on the first pass and passed on the second time. We kept saying that there's really no statistical difference in performance on standardized testing. When you look at, uh, you know, obviously statistically between PBL and SGL, but we're now beginning to see over the last two years that PBL students are beginning to perform better in standardized testing, such as the foundational basic science GOMAT, looking very, very similar, a little bit better in COMLEX and USMLE, not only at our local level, but against national benchmark level. Here's a little more evidence, I think, uh, that's really hot off the press. In, you may not know, but in 2018, osteopathic residencies had to apply for accreditation to the allopathic medical school residency match, which was run by the ACGME. This is the Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education. So essentially, our DO residencies joined the ACGME allopathic residencies or MD residencies in 2018. Most of them by 2019 had already approved, give it, had already achieved accreditation, but by 2020, all of the residencies uh, osteopathically were able to get accreditation by the ACGMP. This is no small task, but it tells you that we are equal to our allopathic brethren in the training that we were receiving all those years. Now, why did this have to happen? Well, we were at a point where some of the DOs were not getting fellowship accreditation and certification for doing MD fellowships. So when the Osteopathic uh, Association met leadership, met with the ACGME, what was came out of this joining of the two pathways was that it allowed DO program directors to be program directors of MD residency programs. There was a, a threat at that time that they would not allow DO trained uh, physicians that were program directors to be program directors in an MD residency after 2022. It also allowed DOs to become board certified in their fellowships. And that was really highly important. So it leveled the playing field for DOs applying to medic MD residency. Now the match this year was very, very impressive and shows the equality of the osteopathic student when confronted with GME uh, and the challenge of a single uh, pathway to GME. The MD school grads this year, 92.9% .9 matched in a residency. In DO school grads, 91.3% matched in an MD program. So you can see that there really is no difference. You know, if that was 92% and 60% for DOs, we would be concerned. But we are highly, highly competitive. And I can tell you that the DOs from our, our schools and our program are getting the best residencies. Five of our grads are at Jefferson in Philadelphia in high powered residencies in emergency medicine, in anesthesiology, in internal medicine. And when we looked at our match for Rowan SOM, 98% matched. So our match and many of the ones that didn't match will scramble in, in the first few days after the match and then match. Most of the ones who don't match are going for very high level, highly competitive um, residencies that don't have many positions available. Not that they were not qualified, they were extremely qualified. So I hope that shows you a little evidence that we are highly competitive coming out of PBL or SGL and particularly out of SOM.
We have moved over from Blackboard. I'm sure you guys have used the uh, Blackboard in undergrad school. We now have a Canvas uh, learning management system. And each block is a distinct course. Each block has a director and a co-director. Uh, the block syllabus is posted on Canvas. It contains learning objectives and a study guide in addition to everything you need to know to navigate the block successfully. This year, we will have uh, mid-block formative quizzes in all of our blocks that will be used in a formative manner to gauge your individual progress in, in the block at the mid portion. And remember the block directors and facilitators are always available to you in dedicated study hours weekly by appointment to help you with any problems with the material you're learning. I, a little bit more guidance, and this was put together by previous uh, classes. I queried uh, classes on what are they using to study? Why are they successful? What do they use? Here are some of the uh, resources that they use, and these will be available to you. We'll have this uh, printed for you before you start. Also, the library guide is highly important to show you what our library has for you. It is very, very well equipped. Here's some, they were textbooks that are, that are used most often, Boron, um, you may be familiar with, Pathoma. Here are some of the video resources we use, Boards and Beyond, Sketchy, uh, you will, be all familiar with these resources. And then some further online resources here, such as Pathoma. Very popular uh, new question bank is called AMBOSS, and it quickly gained uh, popularity among the second years. It's very, very high level, second level questions that are often seen in USMLE and Comlex. USMLE RX is very, very uh, commonly used. Access Medicine, YouTube. You will also find others that you will like. So here's a little synopsis of the academic qualifications of the class of 2026 sitting here before us. There are 288 students in this class. We are the largest medical school in New Jersey. 42.6% of your class are male, 57% female, other 0.33%. Your science GPA average is 3.62. Your MCAT average was 507.05. Your MCAT bio was 127.10 or greater. We had over 6,000 applicants for these 288 seats. Uh, we remain dedicated to New Jersey with the ability of trying to serve the underserved communities, particularly of South Jersey, where you're at. 71% came from the state of New Jersey, out of state 29%. We have excellent diversity in all of our classes and our underrepresented minorities are actually at 18%. I I can I always have to show this. This this just was incredible. In March 2019, a group of PBL zealots put together a team and entered the Sim Wars competition sponsored by the AMSA or American Medical Students Association. It's an MD organization. We actually had two teams that came from our SOM emergency medicine and simulation medicine club. The teams competed uh, that competed came from both MD schools across the nation and, and osteopathic schools as well. Both teams uh, uh, faced off for two days of fierce competition managing multiple patient clinical simulations using high fidelity mannequins that we have in our, our sim lab now that they did not have at that time. These, I can tell you that these simulations are at the level of a senior emergency medicine resident 
complexity. Team went to went pretty deep in the competition before being eliminated. And uh, team one won the competition and was crowned national champion from SOM. They eliminated several known medical schools in the final round, Baylor, North Texas State, University of Alabama, Campbell University and Osteopathic School in North Carolina. The team once by winning this competition was going to compete in the global competition in 2020. But of course, you know what happened? COVID happened and everything was canceled and it, it's been on hold since then for the international uh, competition. It was going actually planned to be in Poland. So just to summarize, if you choose PBL, it should be based on your prefer preferred learning style. No matter whether you choose SGL or PBL, we guarantee that you will be competent and, and more when you graduate. But you prefer self-directed learning, small groups. You enjoy teaching your colleagues. Uh, you may have aspirations for being in academics later. Now, all efforts were made to accommodate your first choice of both PBL campus location, IR admissions department, and our administrative staff. And they were based on rolling acceptance dates of PBL, PBL acceptance and availability of the positions in a rolling manner at both campuses. You did not get your first choice of campus location or even the tensegrity pathway, which you may want to choose to change. You can still ask to be put on a wait list created to document your requests. Do this as soon as possible. Every year, students leave Rowan and SOM for a variety of reasons. Financial, being closer to family, absolutely getting a late admission to um, medical school that was number one. And this will allow some transfer of campus and location and curriculum. But we can't guarantee these positions will materialize. But history says that some of these slots will open over the last three years. We have seen that. Both PBL campuses are beautiful, identically equipped, and all students, both SGL and PBL, are invited to both campuses to study and use our new anatomage virtual dissection table, which is actually gonna be delivered in two weeks. Our campuses are only 30 minutes apart maximum for a commute. Most of our medical legal, uh, medical scholarship at CSLL is now WebEx or recorded to decrease the amount of travel and allow you to have more study time. Those courses begin in September. So this is the next critical step in your journey towards joining the most noble and rewarding of professions. You will have the honor and the privilege of caring for sick and injured patients who will need your expertise. In the next four years, we will give you that expertise to do so. We are proud to announce that Rowan SOM was voted second out of 37 DO medical schools nationally by a group of pre-med experts. Some of the reasons noted for the ranking included our excellent PBL and SGL curricula pathways. Dr. Hushman said, our president of Rowan University said, why aren't we number one? Well, we won't rest until we're number one. We will strive for excellence. But the one thing we can guarantee you, whether we're Avis or Hertz, we guarantee you a first-class medical education. My door is always ajar. Feel free to stop by at your convenience and discuss any problems that you may have or just would like to bounce an idea off of me. Some of my favorites are some of the, the lines from Top Gun, I see some real genius in your flying, Maverick. You know, some of those things. Ron Burgundy, at Anchorman. Texas Hold'em Poker, if you'd like to discuss. I'd like to hear from your favorite restaurants. And 
perhaps we can develop a list of inexpensive Pinot Noirs under $12 from our discussions. So consider setting up a session to shadow one of our PBL students in the classroom in the fall term if you're still unsure of your choice. We still have two, we have a half of our neuroscience uh, block going and the immunology block. So contact me or John if you would like to shadow those classes. I look forward to meeting all of you soon. I wish you great health, happiness, and continued success in your medical journey. And I would like to open it up for questions, if you have any. We do have a couple that came through the chat, Dr. Scally. What Sarah and I are going to do is Sarah's going to go through the um, the chat feature, and I'm going to go through the Q&A feature, and we'll take turns okay. sharing them. Um, Okay, let me see. So a student asks that because uh, they believe that PBL was redesigned in 2019. Can you talk a little bit about what was changed and how it makes PBL better? Well, if we did change with the SGL renewal process. Uh, before SGL started with their new curriculum, we had a three-year process. And we tried to parallel both the SGL and the PBL uh, pathways as close as possible. So some of the changes were medical scholarship, CSLL, and procedures. But you're going to see the, you know, the same SP encounters. We've always had that as the same. Uh, you will have the H and P course in parallel with the SGL. So basically the combined, the more common elements were what changed. And some of the things that we changed were beta testing mid block quizzes in 19, in the, in the year 2019 and 2020. And we're moving forward to have mid block formative quizzes in each of the uh, courses. Well, thanks, Dr. Scali. Let's see. Next one. Uh, I noticed that PBL does not have or does not utilize the gross anatomy lab. Does this have a significant effect on uh, regional anatomy knowledge? It has not. And there are some exciting new changes being made this this year, uh, hot off the press. Uh, we don't have, as you know, the SGL curriculum renewal developed an integrated regional anatomy course as the first course that everyone takes in SGL, which is nine weeks. What we did in PBL was we had specific uh, cadaveric tutorials that were done by Rocco Garcia, our anatomy chair, designed specifically for the blocks. Uh, so when we were in the cardio renal block, he would take small groups of eight to 10 students and take them through a prosected um, cadaver and show the integrated anatomy that the SGL students were using as a course. The rest of anatomy for us is self-learned, but there are probably six to eight of those tutorials and maybe more coming this year. Now, what we're going to be doing this year is a little bit different because of the increase in the number of students. We're going to be using the Robert Wood Johnson model for a teaching anatomy, of which Dr. Garcia also teaches at Robert Wood. And we will be live streaming these sessions to all 120 students. You may not know that these cadaveric sessions in the past were optional. You did not have to attend them. They were not graded. They were there strictly for your learning uh, ability. So this year, these the live streaming will occur with even more sessions and they will be recorded. So if you can't catch the live session, then you will be able to review the echoes at any time. 
And this has worked extremely well at Robert Wood Johnson with a class that's very similar in size. I think you'll like it a lot. I was really impressed with it. That's awesome. Thanks, Dr. Scallon. Um, since students self-direct their learning and groups self-direct their choice of learning issues, is there any way that ensures students aren't learning every, or I'm sorry, are learning everything they need to know and aren't missing any topics they should be learning for boards, for example? Sure. Obviously, in medicine, you will never learn everything. The pursuit will be the rest of your life with continuing medical education until the end of your career. The pursuit is what will make you the base, best physician. We can only take snapshots of the information that you need to know. Otherwise, we would have to give you a list. And if you just learn this list, that's all you need to know for medicine. Unfortunately, medicine is too complex for that. So you will learn far more than you will be tested on. And that's what we really want you to go with that attitude. I'm gonna learn as much as I can. Assessment is only gonna be a small snapshot of it, but I can tell you that snapshot pretty much uh, correlates well with how you do on those exams, even though it's a snapshot, predicts very well how well you're gonna do on the licensure exams. So it, again, it is trusting the process. Now we do have a syllabus for each of the courses and we do have a study guide within each of those syllabi. This is something we added two years ago in response to some of the questions like you're having now. Do I know enough? Will I ever know, learn enough? Did I learn the right thing? Keep asking yourself those questions because the pursuit will get you there. Awesome. Um, so the next question in the Q&A is, will OCS and OMM be held at the Sewell campus or will Sewell campus students have to venture to Stratford for certain courses or extracurriculars? Uh, we will have uh, two cohorts uh, of h and and OMM. They will be taught, the Sewell campus will have their own faculty. They will be teaching the same syllabus as the Stratford faculty, but the faculty will be separate and you will not have to travel uh, to the uh, Stratford campus for OCS, h and or OMM. Our faculty, though, is one faculty, so it's they they work together, even though they're running two courses, they're running the same course. They meet frequently to make sure that they have good synchrony. Awesome. Next one. Hello. On the Sewell campus, will all cohorts be on the same schedule? Uh, for example, all students start earlier or later, or will the schedule depend on the cohort? You mean whether the, I, I think you're referring who's going to get the 8 to 10.30 class and who's going to get the 10.45 to 115? I think so. Well? Yeah, I think uh, so. We'll probably mix that up so that uh, you, you're exposed to both. You know, some people might actually like the early class and study, you know, right after class. Others may may like the later start and study before class. So. You know, this is something that we we're going to be working out, but I think the gut is that we're probably going to uh, mix uh, the times. Um, the next one in the chat is can PBL students declare an area of distinction? Yes, absolutely. And we're always looking for new areas of distinction. You, there is no distinction in areas of distinction between PBL and SGL. You will work together. Awesome, thanks, Dr. Scalic. What's the next one? Um, are the provided are the resources we've discussed provided with tuition, um, or is this an external purchase, like an additional cost? If you're referring to the question banks and things that are adjunctive learning tools, 
there is there is money set aside from your tuition for that and you'll be able to choose which ones you wish to have that process will be revealed in orientation but you will be able to pick if you like amboss you can buy amboss um okay what would you say the typical learning curve is like for pbl students versus sgl students well because the we have a double pass system versus a single pass uh you may see some difference but in the end of the two years it's all you know the the, the acquisition of knowledge is the same just a little bit different getting there And then how could the PBL students know the extent uh, of detail in a particular topic that they should know when studying for board exams? John, so could, guess, you repeat, could you repeat that question? I, I lost you a little bit here. Yeah, you're good. The question is, um, how can the PBL students know the extent of detail for a particular topic that they should know when studying for board exams? So I guess maybe if things aren't covered in class, what supplements it? Yeah, I mean, obviously utilizing your your big SIB in the first year is going to be extremely important for guidance. They've been through that first year. They're the pros from Dover. They'll tell you what to study. Or they'll guide you to where you should find the information. The programs work very well of mentoring. And again, our study guides will help you too in the syllabi. I want to jump down because there's actually a question further that relates to that. Um, someone asked, how are we assigned our big? Is this something that happens in pre-matric or orientation? Uh, our administrative staff uh, assigns uh, the bigs and littles before orientation. They try to, you know, how they match. We don't have any real true matching criteria. Not knowing the first year students, it makes it pretty much impossible to try to match them, you know, in, in interests and things. But uh, I can tell you that our second years just love mentoring the first years. They're very nurturing. And then I see, is the DXR program only available during class sessions or are we able to access them on, are our students able to access them on their own? No, they're only available to us in the class so we can maintain the integrity of the cases. And then that's not saying that we don't have other, other uh, case banks that we can use like aquifer you know there are things that we can supplement for you that would be very similar and then i think i might have missed one from before are the classes mandatory in person yes we actually give you three this year we give three get out of jail cards free for illness for mental health days, for family emergencies, for medical emergencies. So there are three. Once you use your three, then all requests go to the associate dean for pre-clerkship for approval. That's a little bit of a difference again from SGL, right? SGL does not have mandatory attendance to their lectures. But because of our small group interaction and group teaching and learning, we have to have uh, our students there. It wouldn't work. I got a couple questions privately chatted me. Let me find those. So how, how have you seen uh, PBL students develop relationships with faculty? Very, very well. We have a, an incredible faculty. Very, very nurturing, 
Uh, our PBL facilitators of the first year are basic scientists, many of which have labs in the research building uh, in which they invite students to come and do research with them. Many of our PBL students are published at the end of the first or second year through research that's being done by the facilitators. Because we're smaller, we can establish closer relationships. Um, the next one I have in the Q&A is how often do the groups change? We change our group every block and we change the facilitator every block. We want you to be exposed to as many different teaching and learning styles of, of your peers as we can. And you get to know your peers that way. I think I have a related question to peers in the Big Little program. Um, a student asked, can we request a specific big if we know someone who's currently in the program? I would say yes. I have never been asked that question, but uh, what I would do is remember the name Sarah Pollock and uh, email Sarah with your request. Um, if PBL doesn't work for you, can you switch to SGL? It depends on what time of the of the curriculum it is. There have been a rare transfer of PBL to SGL in the first week of the course, but because of the integrated regional anatomy course, once you get past a week's worth of anatomy in a single course, it's almost impossible to catch up. So I would say that it would be very, dis if you decided to change, it should be ASAP. You can see how much information of daily lectures you could miss in one week in the SGL. SGL to PBL, it's happened once or twice in five years as well, but that's an easier switch. And then we have another question. Do PBL students get to be hands on during their anatomy sessions? Uh, they are the students asking particularly for kinesthetic learners. Well, as I mentioned, these live streaming uh, sessions with our anatomists there are going to be prosected cadavers. But you can arrange to go to an SGL anatomy session and and observe or participate if there is room for at that time but you can also request from the anatomy department to set up a session where you might want to you might want to uh, do some dissection of your own and then i got another question are they presented a new case study at every class meeting our cases run about two to two and a half sessions. So you can see they're pretty in depth. Um, is there a greater emphasis on physiology as opposed to biochem slash anatomy in the blocks based on the PBL curriculum? We emphasize more biochemistry and physiology in the first year. And what was the other discipline that you mentioned? Biochem. Ooh, hold on. Sorry, my chat just closed. Where'd it go? Uh, biochem and anatomy in the block based on people. Yeah, uh, the anatomy, yes, because we will have those live stream sessions with each block. Physiology and biochemistry are definitely emphasized in the uh, first year. More microbiology, pathology, pharmacology, 
in the second year. We do have a short immunology course at the end of the first year that's three weeks. That's a very intensive three weeks, but uh, it, immunology has become so important in treating uh, malignancy and other autoimmune diseases that we had to emphasize immunology. So we added that as a separate course. Um, oh, did you want to go, John? No, 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 go ahead. I was just following okay. along with the Q&A. Um, are the echo recordings for PBL students the lectures that were for SGL students? Yes, all the SGL lectures are echoed and available to PBL students to review on their own. Um, are PBL classrooms open for students to study in off hours? Yes. Cool. 24-7. And then someone asked, what if I'm on the SGL wait list and there are no openings before the first week of classes? That is unfortunate that it would, you would have to be a PBL student at that point. Oh, this is a good one too. So now that the PBL class size is increasing, is there mm -hmm. still going to be a big SIB for each student? I'm sorry, what for each student, John? I'm sorry. Is there still going to be a big for each student? Yes. Yeah. Maybe the bigs may have more than one uh, mentored a uh, little. And I think I'm seeing the last question. Sarah, do you want to take the last question? I'm not seeing any more. Okay, I have it. It's in front of me. So will facilitators jump in if students are getting off track in a session? Yes, gently. And what we'll try to bring you back with, again, metacognitive questioning. But we will allow you to go down the wrong pathway because there's a lot to be learned by doing that as well, as long as we get back to the right pathway. It's very difficult for us when we first started PBL to not want to tell you what the real answer is. <laughs> and we had a lot of lesions on our tongues uh, from biting uh, to try to keep quiet. But we've learned we've learned to to handle that properly. You're too funny. <laughs> All right, it looks like everything kind of quieted down. Any other questions, Sarah? Do you want to keep an eye on the Q and I'll look at the chat real quick. Just to see if we missed anything. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, um, what are some academic resources on campus that's often utilized by PBL students? Uh, specifically, I mean, obviously, we have an incredible library, and we will have an extension library at Sewell as well, which has some really beautiful study carols within the uh, library there. Uh, everything's available to you. I mean, we're, we're talking about research areas of distinction. In involved in community projects, many of our students. Uh, were very involved both PBL and SGL in the vaccination clinic for COVID. In which 60,000 uh, community uh, dwellers came to get their uh, COVID vaccine. So there's been, you have an incredible amount of support on both sides. We do have a, a summer research fellowship too, that's called Smurf, where if you develop a research project that you want to do, you can apply for a Smurf um, grant of $2,500 to support your, your research. It can be clinical, can be bench, and we happen to have this year, we have added one of our facilitators, uh, a new faculty member is the director of the IRB, who is a great resource for research. So yeah, we're just excited to have Dr. Gupta join us this year. And then I don't see any new questions in the chat. Sarah, anything in Q&A? Um, 
one more. Do you find that students get better with the case studies? Yeah, pretty quickly. You know, I would say after two weeks, uh, they're rocking and rolling on these cases. I really, the, the learning curve is very, very steep and quick because of the IT skills that students have, you know, that they bring to the table. That helps as well. And they, it, the process really is very reproducible from case to case. Awesome. I don't see any new questions in the chat. Yeah, Sorry, I have no more in the Q and A. All right. Well, I thank everyone for their questions. I think they were really excellent. If you need to contact me, scally at rowan.edu, and we can talk one on one. And I'll put that in the chat too, Dr. Scally. Scally at rowan.edu. All right, so then I guess we'll just thank everyone so much one more time for coming. We have a couple more sessions in the series as well. Um, we have a camp virtual campus tour this Saturday that we hope to see you all out. We're going to have a rotation session next week with Dr. Tartagli and a couple more in May. Um, again, we're so glad you all have come on this journey with us virtually. Um, hope we will be able to do this very, very, very soon in person. But thank you all so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of the week. Stay well, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Skelly. Mm -hmm. You bet. Thank you.